introduce. Perfect. Thanks, Wayne. Uh, so our next presentation will be by Megan Cranfield, who's going to be speaking to some initial findings and where we're at right now with the cannabis research, which has taken uh, a few unexpected turns and delays, which I think is a result of the pandemic and all of that fun availability constraints, I think, that we've been experiencing, but she'll provide an update and look at some of the, the next steps, which includes some content and context with producers that we are hoping to move forward with. And I, I won't steal the, the spotlight from Megan, so I'll move on and let her take the lead. Thanks for the introduction, Sarah. Um, just for a quick intro about myself, my name is Megan Cranfield. I'm a RPD second year student at the University of Guelph. Um, and I started working on this project with Sarah at the beginning of the summer semester. So kind of new, <laughs> but um, lots of learning to do. Uh, so the official project name is Assessing Land Use Planning Tools to Mitigate Odor and Lighting Nuisance Related to Cannabis Production. But we found that our project is starting to encompass a broader spectrum than that, especially as we continue to research and find gaps where municipalities have essentially been left to their own devices when it comes to planning for cannabis. Um, but I will get more into that later. Oops. Won't let me go to the next page. Oh, there we go. Uh, before I started, I wanted to extend a special thank you to Omafra's Agri-Food Alliance for our project funding and support. And I've split the presentation into four parts, covering the purpose, the goals and objectives, some research trends, and then finally our next steps moving forward. So let's get into it. The purpose of this project is to research and understand the changes with planning for cannabis production at the municipal level. Uh, though we hope to, through this, we hope to identify areas for improvement, um, best practices and commonalities across different jurisdictions. And then by identifying these commonalities, we can create a database that connects municipalities to each other so that it can see what does and does not work in different areas across Ontario. The reason we chose cannabis was because its novelty has created a gap in planning policy research, yet it directly impacts these rural communities and how they conduct planning. Um, these uh, communities are being affected by the rapid growth of production facilities and the lack of direction from provincial or federal authorities. Um, additionally, there's a lot of talk about the potential economic benefits from uh, legalizing recreational cannabis, but it's important for these benefits to be balanced against the issues with lighting and odor for the neighboring properties. So moving on to our goals and objectives, our summarized issue statement is that increased cannabis production has resulted in various nuisance complaints. And the goal is to understand how land use planning can mitigate these issues related to odor and lighting. I've split our objectives into two categories, deliverables and tasks. Um, our deliverables being a publicly available database with a consolidation of information collected from municipalities across Ontario. This way there's evidence of some common practices which will help potentially identify a provincial standard. Another deliverable was the literature review that commenced in the summer of 2020 and has kind of been built upon since um, by various students working on the project and has also factored into OMAFRA's task force that is looking into greenhouse lighting policies. We are also hoping to draft a good neighbor policy for the cannabis producers to act as a guide for interacting with, with municipalities to kind of um, strengthen that relationship. And then finally, a report to summarize the overall project. Some of our tasks include interviewing stakeholders such as municipal planners and production companies, uh, conducting case studies of a few municipalities with interesting and rare regulations. Uh, we'd like to conduct some workshops and then also production site visits where we can see uh, firsthand how producers are um, implementing efforts to mitigate odor and lighting concerns. So these next two slides will cover the uh, project progress and status at this point. So we have launched our, prod our policy database um, that serves as the network of information. 
Uh, it is publicly available and is intended to help policymakers determine what might work best in their municipality. Um, this also helped us identify some of the commonalities um, that I will discuss a bit later. And this, all of this information was obtained by researching the zoning bylaws that were available on municipal web pages. Um, we've also completed the literature review, as I mentioned earlier. And then the research reports uh, are following some of the OLT hearings and appeals surrounding cannabis bylaws. Um, and it also includes an ongoing jurisdictional scan surrounding the greenhouse lighting policies. Where we're at now is researching farm gate sales, uh, interviewing stakeholders, conducting case studies. Uh, and next, we'll be, we will be um, conducting some workshops to help with outreach to rural communities in Ontario. And eventually, we will consolidate our information into a good neighbor policy and a final report. And these two documents will help form um, a toolkit for municipalities preparing to zone for cannabis production. Okay, so for this part of the presentation, I'm going to go over some of the research trends. Um, a little bit of this was covered in this presentation last year, so if it's a little repetitive, I apologize. <laughs> Um, so we have found that the general setbacks from sensitive uses such as schools, public parks, community centers, and places of worship tend to vary between 150 and 300 meters, but there's no um, scientific evidence to support that this distance is effective in terms of mitigating lighter and odor concerns. This has just been a trend that we found. Um, another interesting trend is that municipalities vary between classifying cannabis as a agricultural product or an industrial product. Some classify it as both, and some will specify one or the other. And this distinction determines which zones it's permitted in, and also whether it can be grown indoors or outdoors. Uh, however, we have found that there are a handful of places that only allow indoor growth, um, with some type of air treatment control system. And this is to help mitigate the odor concerns, but also for safety and security reasons, it's important to keep it um, under lock and key. Uh, finally, we noticed that a lot of municipalities have enacted um, an interim control bylaw to try and halt any cannabis production before uh, the municipality was able to implement any proper zoning regulations. Many of these control bylaws um, have expired since then and municipalities have updated their zoning bylaw, but there are a few that have been extended until later this year. Um, so we'll still be updating our database as those uh, come to expire. So some of the interesting regulations um, that we came across were stipulations of 3000 meters between cannabis facilities. I thought this was interesting because you would assume the best neighbor for a cannabis production site is another cannabis production site because they're not going to complain about the smell or the light. So I thought it was interesting that they had this uh, separation between the two. Um, there was also smaller setbacks for facilities uh, that were micro growth operations. And for those who don't know, a micro operation is just uh, a smaller crop yield. Um, and then some municipalities within the green belt uh, restricted indoor growth because of the long-term impact on the farmland from concrete structures. So they would allow you to put a greenhouse over top of the plants as long as there was no um, permanent concrete base underneath. Uh, okay, so we're going to get into some of the spotlights of some interesting information. Uh, I wanted to spotlight Brock Township because they had a lot of interesting information uh, we were able to access their zoning bylaw and we interviewed one of their planners earlier this year and they found that their biggest issue was with the illegal growers and medicinal growers. Um, the illegal growers obviously don't follow the same standards for growing cannabis in Brock and often generate complaints from the neighbors due to smell and noise concerns such as the sounds of trucks, gates, daily operations and an interesting thing they said was barking dogs. Um, they'll have these dogs on the property as a security feature, but they're not trained and they can pose a threat to the neighbors and their pets. And when these dogs go missing and they get um, collected by the pound, they never get picked up because they don't want to, they don't want to take responsibility for these animals. Um, the medicinal growers and designated growers have been causing issues because a lot of them were established before the zoning bylaw it was in place and therefore they're not subject to the new setbacks. 
Um, and there's also no penalty for growing more than the approved amount. Um, authorities can, if they show up and they catch you growing too much, they're allowed to destroy the excess plants, but there's no fines or anything on top of that. So that can make it really hard to monitor. So in an effort to mitigate these concerns, Brock Township has established a mandatory pre-consultation meeting for the potential growers and recreational growers uh, in order to discuss the necessary requirements before the farmers are able to start their operation. Uh, our interviewee noted that, that, that this um, effort has drastically reduced the number of issues with designated growers because many people decide to withdraw their application after meeting with the municipality and they've seen how many steps are required in the process. And it's a little bit hard to decide if this is an ideal strategy or not because it does mitigate the issues uh, surrounding the designated growers and the recreational growers, but it deters people from entering the cannabis market and leaves all the profits up to the larger production companies who have the time and money to undertake this lengthy process. So the second spotlight is on Wellington County. Um, they actually enacted a countywide interim control bylaw and it's set to expire in September of 2022. And this was on top of any additional bylaws at the municipal level within their jurisdiction. Uh, for reference, this is areas like uh, Erin, Mapleton, uh, Wellington North, Post Lynch, that kind of area. Uh, and then during their interim control bylaw, they've conducted some research, a little bit similar to what we are looking at, but at the regional level. Uh, they wanted to find a solution that would help their municipalities uh, streamline the approach to cannabis production. And when we interviewed the county representative, they didn't have that much information, but the report has been released to the public since then. Um, it's, their findings are a little bit similar to ours, um, but what they did is they consolidated it into a report and made recommendations for all of the lower tier municipalities. So now that they have, now they have something to work from since the provincial government gave no guidelines or setbacks or any type of, um, direction for what the municipality should be doing. This was interesting to see because a lot of counties are passing the responsibility down to their lower tier municipalities. Uh, for example, we reached out to the region of Waterloo and for an interview and they had said that we would have better luck communicating with the municipalities themselves instead of the region as a whole. Um, because there's no, there's not a lot of countywide rules. It's all up to the individual municipality. Uh, I found this broader approach makes it a lot easier for these small rural communities to develop zoning bylaws because often the planning department is one or two people and it can be a lot to kind of take on this, take on the cannabis production uh, rules all by yourself. Um, all right, and the last one, I quickly wanted to spotlight our expo that we attended a few weeks ago where Professor Epp was actually a keynote speaker. We had two really strong takeaways from this expo. Firstly, the, um, there's a disconnect between municipalities and consultants in the cannabis industry. One of the panelists actually made a comment that if you had a greenhouse, you could switch it to grow cannabis to increase your profits, which is not the case at all that we've seen in our research. There's a lot more planning that goes into cannabis production and it can put the growers at a disadvantage when they're told they can simply transition their greenhouse to cannabis when there are a lot more rules around cannabis than flowers or vegetables. Just JJ. <laughs> Second, some of the corporate representatives mentioned their efforts to try to refrain comparing cannabis to alcohol when talking about what is and is not allowed. We had been discussing the fact that it was a cannabis expo, but there was no cannabis for sale or sampling on site. And this is not something you would see anywhere else. You wouldn't, we said you wouldn't go to a beer and wine expo and expect there not to be any beer and wine. And when we made this comment, um, we were told that the industry is trying to get away from comparing the two and instead use food as a comparison because of the agricultural aspect. And we thought this is really interesting because a vegetable is never going to be treated the same as cannabis. So it was just an interesting comment that we came across. Okay, so moving on to some of the challenges we've been facing in our research. 
Um, there are some issues with terminology. Different municipalities define cannabis production um, differently and they use different terms. And then other municipalities will simply list it as an agricultural product or an industrial product and not define it separately. There are also a couple policy limitations uh, for the operations that were able to open up before the municipality was able to implement. So they have to account for the pre-existing grow operations and the legal non-conforming areas and things like that. And then similar to the terminology issue, there are inconsistencies across the province due to the lack of provincial involvement. Uh, many municipalities have requested better involvement for the, from the province in setting standards for zoning bylaws. Um, or even funding research into the science behind cannabis odor and how it travels. However, uh, also at the expo, some of the panelists discussed their desire for less provincial involvement in regulation, which contradicts what we've been hearing from the municipal pl planners during our interviews. So it's interesting to note that there are still a lot of different sides and opinions on this issue. Some more challenges are LPAT appeals, including municipalities that have allowed site-specific amendments for cannabis operations. Um, there are also a lot of challenges accessing municipal documents. Many of these small rural towns don't actively update and monitor their websites, so it can be difficult to find the information we're looking for. And then finally, and arguably one of the most frustrating challenges to overcome is the stigma surrounding cannabis. We frequently ask ourselves the question, when discussing odor, is cannabis odor really that much worse than manure? Or are people outraged simply because it's a drug that has recently come out of prohibition and still holds a bad reputation? All right, so just wrapping up, we're moving on to our next steps. Um, we will be continuously updating our uh, policy database as the last few interim bylaws expire. Uh, we are also still in the midst of conducting some interviews with stakeholders. Um, at our expo last week, we made some connections with growers and are excited about the possibility to take some tours of their facilities. And then we, also, we will also be conducting uh, case studies and beginning to structure our good neighbor policy. So if you're interested in tracking our progress or want some more information, you can find it at sarahepp.com slash cannabis. Um, thank you everyone for listening and I can open it up to questions or comments.